Today I'm going to tell you the story of this gorgeous, stunning Egyptian princess that became Empress and Queen of Iran, Fazia Fawad. You might not have heard of her before, but by the end of this video, she is definitely going to be somebody that you stand. Her story is just so inspirational. Before we get into it, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Korean Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn on your notifications so you never miss an upload. Now, before we get into her story, as usual, I am going to give you some lesser known facts about her and we're going to talk about a couple of her favorite things, her childhood, but her impact and her beauty. How did she take the West by storm in her prime? Because she has movie star good looks, right? A shy, pretty girl with blue eyes and black hair, she was described by the Egyptian writer and Coutier Adel Sabit as a supremely naive, overprotected, cellophone wrapped, gift package little girl who lived in bucolic surroundings, mobbed by adoring servants, aunts and ladies in waiting. In the eyes of the world, Fazia was the epitome of glamour, her style a mixture of European fashion and oriental mystique. Her portrait taken by Cecile Beaton appeared on the cover of Life magazine in 1942 and took the world by storm because people was just stunned by her beauty. She was compared to Hedy Lamarr, which I think they look exactly alike. That's who I thought. Hedy Lamarr is the reason why you're using your cell phone or you're watching me on this TV right now. Now, she definitely helped with the invention of Wi-Fi and she was deemed one of the most beautiful women in the world and in Hollywood but she was very intelligent and had a higher IQ than that of Albert Einstein. I have her pinned in the comments. You can watch that out later. You will not be disappointed. What was Princess Fazia's flat impact on the fashion and beauty industry? Ray Agayan, an Oscar winning costumier who dressed Barbara Streisand and Diana Ross once claimed that Fazia was his most difficult client because she knew exactly how she wanted to look. Her signature look involved things finger curl tresses, red lipstick, dresses nipped in at the waist, T-strap heels, and lavish furs and jewelry. She was very fashionable and she would spend a lot of money on lavish jewelry. Her favorite color was said to be yellow and gold, so leave a yellow heart in the comments for her. Her favorite cuisine was French cuisine, but specifically French cuisine from Egypt. The royals had the best French chefs cooking for them. She also loved bonbons. When it came to fitness, she was very active, as we will see in her childhood. She loved riding horses, dancing, and taking long walks in her many gardens during her prime. She lived a pretty healthy life as she lived to be 91 years old, passed away in 2013, before she died. Even in her older age, she was in shape and coherent, so she was really health conscious. Now let's get into her childhood. Once upon a time in the land of pharaohs, there was a little girl named Fazia who would one day become a queen. Princess Fazia of Egypt was born on November 5th, 1921 to King Fawad I of Egypt and Sudan and his second wife Nazli Sabri at the luxurious Ra's El Tine Palace in Alexandria. Growing up in the palace, Princess Fazia was surrounded by opulence and glamour. From a young age, she was taught the ways of royalty and was expected to carry herself with grace and poise. But behind the glitz and glamour, Fazia was just a normal little girl who loved to play and have fun. Her family has spoken about how she was a very gentle and kind child with a heart of gold. She had a close bond with her mother who was always there to comfort her when she needed it. Her brothers and sisters also adored her and they spent countless hours playing in the palace gardens together. Just like any other child, Princess Fazia had a variety of hobbies and interests. She loved to read, especially fairy tales and adventure stories. She also enjoyed painting and drawing, often creating beautiful pictures of the lush Egyptian landscapes that she loved. She loved flowers and gardens, right? She spent a lot of her time with her siblings playing in the gardens. Despite being a princess, Fazia was also a hard worker. She was diligent in her studies and was determined to excel in everything she did. She attended school in Switzerland where she became fluent in English and French in addition to her native Arabic. But her home life was a little traumatic to say the least. To put it mildly, her parents hated each other. Whenever her mother's strong will resisted her father, he would slap her and lock her in the castle, only releasing her for operas and flower exhibitions. Princess Fazia was disappointed when she went home from her education in Europe and found she did not have the same freedom as she had experienced in Switzerland. According to Egyptian customs, she was supposed to remain indoors all the time and she just did not like feeling 
bound, but she still loved her native Egypt so much, right? But her father did end up passing away and her brother became the new king. Now let's talk about this marriage, right? Once upon a time in a tale of political intrigue and royal matchmaking, Princess Fazia of Egypt was married to Iran's crown prince, Mohammad Reza Halavi, and excuse me if I mispronounce, the CIA later revealed that this union was more strategic than romantic, but hey, who doesn't love a good royal wedding, right? The Egyptians were bougie, okay? They were used to luxury and stuff. And so when the prince came to try to convince Fazia's brother, King Farouk, to marry, he brought along a lot of gifts and they were not pleased with the prince's gifts, okay? They was like, what is this? However, the king's trusty advisor, Ali Maher Pasha, convinced him that an alliance with Iran would boost Egypt's standing in the Islamic world. To gear up for life in Iran, Fazia got herself a Persian tutor, but found it extremely difficult to learn the language. The royal couple got engaged in May 1938. Upon arrival in Tehran, the newlyweds celebrated their union again at Marble Palace, their future home. Iran's capital went all out to welcome the princess on the streets. They had banners, decorations, and massive celebrations featuring acrobats, fencing, and football. The wedding dinner was a lavish French style feast complete with caviar from the Caspian Sea, lamb, and all sorts of delicacies. But not all was rosy in this fairy tale. Fazia wasn't a fan of her father-in-law, who she said was a horrible and violent man, ready to attack anyone who displeased him. The princess discovered that her new husband was pretty dysfunctional due to his upbringing. The prince's father was afraid his son would develop homosexual tendencies if he showed him any affection or attention. So the crown prince lacked the emotional intelligence required to be a good spouse and was instead more like a ruffian than husband material to Fazia. Her new mother-in-law and sister-in-law were terrible. They did not like her at all. They were all competing for the love of the prince and despised this new beauty in the palace. One day her sister-in-law got into such a heated argument with her, she broke a vase over Fazia's head which really shocked and traumatized her. Her husband never stood up for her and she felt helpless there and they also thought that she was very spoiled, right? On top of all these abuses, at least she thought she would enjoy the food. Food, according to her, paled in comparison to the French cuisine she loved back home and she described it as subpar. She also found Iranian palaces to be underwhelming compared to Egypt's grand residences in a culture a little more restrictive than what she was used to in Egypt. And Egypt was pretty restrictive during those days, so that says a lot. So to her, it was a culture shock and Iran was still a pretty new establishment at that time. Egypt was a little bit more established so they were still getting their feet off the ground with architecture and stuff but she was very very critical and I think it was because she didn't like her husband. In 1941 Mohammad Reza became the Shah of Iran and Fazia took on charitable work with the Association for the Protection of Pregnant Women and Children. Together they had a daughter but happiness eluded them. Fazia was homesick and tensions with her in-laws reached boiling point. To make matters worse the Shah was quite the ladies man often spotted with other women. Rumors swirled about Fazia's own infidelity but her her friends insisted it was just gossip. Ultimately, she sought treatment for depression and yearned to return to Egypt. She was so depressed that she refused to leave the palace for any functions and no longer smiled. Her family back in Egypt eventually found out how miserable she was and her brother who was king was not happy about his beloved sister going through all of this. He sent to have officials go check up on her. When the ambassador reached Tehran, visited Fazia immediately, he was shocked by what he saw. As he reported back to Egypt, the princess was all skin and bones and her shoulder blades jutted out like the fins of some undernourished fish. She wasn't eating and barely had any life in her eyes. This was a state of emergency for Egypt and they wanted her back home, but she couldn't just get up and leave like that because she was now queen of Iran. Fazia hatched a great escape plan under the pretense of being homesick and wanting to visit Cairo for publicity. She packed her most prized little possession and fleed. In May 1945, Fazia moved back to Cairo and secured an Egyptian divorce. She fought tooth and nail to get this divorce because it was not custom for queens to divorce kings. The Shah was embarrassed and tried to win her back, but she stood firm, refusing to go back to Iran, and Egypt stood behind her firmly also. Although Iran initially refused to recognize the divorce, they finally granted it in 1948. Fazia reclaimed her title as princess of Egypt but had to leave her daughter behind in Iran which was the conditions for her to leave. I wonder how her daughter grew up to feel about that. The official reason for the divorce was Fazia's health and both countries insisted that their relationship remained intact. They didn't want no beef with each other. It was all good. Love finally found its way to Princess Fazia when she tied the knot with Colonel Ismail Shirin on March 28, 1949 at the Kuba Palace in Cairo. Unlike her previous marriage, this one was for love 
love and it made her far happier than being with the Shah of Iran. The wedding was also a lot more private with no leaks of who or what was there and it was small, nothing like the glitz and grammar, right? She grew tired of all the extraness and wanted something more intimate. The groom was no ordinary man. He was a Trinity College Cambridge graduate and had been a high ranking Egyptian minister of war and Navy. The couple lived in an estate owned by the princess and Mahdi, Cairo, and also had a villa in Alexandria. Together they had a lovely daughter and son. But there's more tragedy. The people rebelled and staged a coup against her brother King Farouk. Princess Fawzia of Egypt was no longer a princess after the 1952 revolution. She lost her titles and much of her possessions when the revolutionaries took over. Instead she was known simply as Fawzia, the same as anybody else. Her brother Farouk took his yacht to Italy following the coup, but Fazia had already been away from Egypt for too long to leave again. Even though all her family, all her siblings flee, she said, I refuse to leave Egypt. She persisted unyielding in her determination. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat extended a peace offering to Fazia's family in 1976 after he took over, decades after the coup. Before visiting Fazia and her villa, he took her daughter, Princess Shanaz, in to stay in one of the historic royal palaces. Seeing the palace where she spent her childhood was a bittersweet experience for Fazia. The news of her coming spread quickly. Soon all of her former servants were waiting on the royal grounds to greet her, many of them wiping away tears as Fazia mourned the world she had formerly known. She hugged everyone she saw. Giving a tour of the palace to the new leader, Fazia led the way up the stairs to the coronation hall. She pointed to the verses of the Quran written in the walls above, saying, I am afraid I think my brother did not read carefully all the verses, she said. If he had we would still be here as the ruling royal family, end quote. She later added, twice in my life I lost the crown. Once I was the queen of Iran and once I was the princess here. She smiled. It's all gone now. It doesn't matter. She was not bitter. She mourned the past but also kept moving forward. She remained very private until the very end. She did get to visit her daughter a lot and her daughter did go back to the palace with her in Egypt, also the one she left behind in Iran. They ended up having like a close relationship, okay? So it wasn't all lost. But Fazia remained in Egypt and settled in Alexandria where she breathed her last on July 2nd, 2013 at age 91 and was buried alongside her beloved husband in Cairo. She was the oldest surviving member of the Muhammad Ali dynasty in Egypt. The day she led visitors through her old palace, she said, when you visit the tombs of kings and queens, you see they leave everything behind, even the crowns, end quote. What a beautiful story. What I liked about her where I was like, oh, wow, is that she stayed even though everyone else fleed. She was determined to not suffer anymore, to not go through this and I love that she stayed till the end she fought but this was a beautiful story um though there were some critics I'll be fair online that was saying she was very harsh with Iran I really really think it was because of her experience with her husband and not because you know she really felt that way inside etc because food can lose its flavor and colors can look dull when you're very depressed and she was treated for depression while she was in Iran she lost a lot of weight the sisters were very harsh with her. Her father-in-law was a tyrant who abused his servants, everyone around him. So she must have been like, what is this? Because even though her father was violent with the mom when she was growing up, her father and her mother loved her so much, sheltered her, babied her. So she was used to being taken care of. And her siblings, her, who was now her brother that became king, loved his sister. It wasn't kind of like the vibes, you know? She had way more freedom in Egypt. And she just felt like an appreciation, you know? Because she was just locked up in that castle, refusing to go anywhere in Iran so I really don't think it's that you know if you marry a guy and it's not who you cracked up to be and they didn't marry for love it was all political she only met him once before they didn't know each other like that they only spoke French to each other so it was a very odd experience for her to go through but I'm glad that she found love in the end comment below your thoughts I love you guys so much thank you for tuning in until next time and if you like the music you're listening to the link is in the description support my brother and leave a yellow heart in the comments for her until next time